the Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. If we want to be what they were, we must do what they did. This statement emphasizes the truth that if we just follow the pattern given to us by the New Testament, that we'll be New Testament Christians just like they were, just like we read about in the Bible. Today, we're going to look at another aspect of this in part two of a series of studies and asking the question, are we truly ready to be what they were? I hope you'll stay tuned and join us for this study after this song of praise. again and thank you for tuning into Bible Talk. There's nothing that we love more than having you join us for our study of God's Word. All of our studies are meant to help you grow spiritually by presenting God's Word in simplicity and truth. As always, I want to thank you personally for giving me this wonderful opportunity to study God's Word with you today. The statement has long been made, if we want to be what they were, we must do what they did. These words have stood as part of our plea to do Bible things in Bible ways, to only do what the New Testament authorizes for us to do. As we noticed last week, there may be a question that we're forgetting to ask in this regard. And that question is, do we truly want to be what they were? And again, maybe we should be asking the question this way, are we truly ready to be what they were? This lesson is the second in a three-part series where we're diving into that question, are we truly ready to be what the first century Christians were? Last week in part one, we looked at Acts chapter 12 and essentially asked the question, are we ready to be what they were in service and in sacrifice? They were willing to serve God no matter what the sacrifice. James paying the ultimate price of even giving his life to serve Christ. This week in part two of our study, we're going to see if we're ready to be what they were in preaching and in penitence. And to do this, I want us to go together to Acts chapter 8. Notice together first, are we ready to be what they were in preaching? In Acts chapter 8, there are three aspects of their preaching that sticks out. First is the scope of their preaching. Notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, he says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. The text here says that they went everywhere preaching the word. Now, sometimes we use the phrase everywhere in a general sense. You know, like if I had to run a few errands in town, maybe if I had to go to the next town over and then come back, and you run into somebody later that day and they say, what have you been up to today? They say, well, I've been everywhere. Well, we've not literally been everywhere, but we've just been kind of going to and fro. But in this particular sense, 
these brethren went out from this central point and went everywhere preaching the word. They were willing to fulfill the great commission, the gospel command, to take the gospel into the whole world. They were willing to take the gospel even into uh, a desert place. Later on in the chapter in Acts 8 and verse 26, uh, we see uh, Philip uh, being sent out into a remote place, a desert place, to go and to preach the gospel to the eunuch. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, in this context, Philip is preaching the gospel in Samaria. And that's important, especially when you consider how the Jews traditionally felt about the Samaritans. In the Jews' mindset, the Samaritans were lower than dogs. But Samaria was not beyond the scope or the reach of the gospel. And so Philip, knowing that the gospel was intended to go everywhere to everyone, even went to Samaria to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ just as our Lord made it a point to go through Samaria. Not only do we see the scope of their preaching reaching out to every place, going everywhere to everyone, but then we also want to notice the subject of their preaching. Three passages that I want us to notice here as we examine the subject of their preaching. What we're going to find in these three passages is that their subject was solely focused on Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, and notice with me first verse 12, he says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Go with me now to verse 25. As we continue to look at their preaching, it says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And then now in verse 35, as Philip is preaching to the eunuch, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The kingdom, the Christ, that was their message, the church. Their message wasn't a message full of a lot of the, the things that we sometimes hear from preachers today. Their preaching was about preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified and His church. There must have been something in that message about Christ that included baptism because the eunuch's response after hearing Jesus preached by Philip said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? But again, notice what was not involved in their preaching. Their preaching wasn't full of personal stories and examples. Their, their sermons were not, uh, were not completely full of illustrations. Now, personal stories and illustrations are good, but those things should be windows into our preaching. Our preaching should be centered upon Christ and upon the kingdom. Their preaching wasn't full of, of uh, prosperity gospel or, or self-help information. Their preaching was centered on Christ. Their preaching was centered upon Jesus Christ and what one, must be, what one must do to be washed in the blood of Christ. But then number three, when it comes to their preaching, we need to notice the spirit of their preaching. They went everywhere to everyone preaching Christ and they did it with great zeal. Notice with me Acts 8 and verses 29 and 30. It says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now it's easy to miss here in the text what we're trying to emphasize. But the Spirit tells Philip, Go join them yourself to this man's chariot. And it says, Philip ran to him. Now I don't know how fast you have to run to catch up to a chariot. But the implication of the text is that the chariot's moving, and Philip runs to him, and joins himself to that uh, Ethiopian treasurer and his chariot. The, the text seems to imply, friends, that Philip ran alongside the chariot. In fact, it's not until verses 30 and 31 and, and verse 36 that the eunuch commands the chariot to stand still. Think about that. How fast does one have to run to keep up with a chariot? Philip's zeal for taking the gospel message to the Ethiopian was so great that he was willing to run toward a stranger and then run with a stranger in order that he might teach this stranger the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The preaching of the first century was not lacking in area. It was not lacking in content, nor was it lacking in zeal. They went everywhere to everyone, preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and did so with a zeal and fervor that I'm afraid sometimes embarrasses us. What impactful preaching they had. But then number two, we need to ask the question, are we ready to be what they were in penitence? Penitence is defined simply as the action or the feeling that shows regret or for having done wrong. Generally speaking, we refer to it as repentance, and that's how it's spoken of in the Bible. We know that it's brought about by godly sorrow that results in a change of mind and heart that then leads to a change of action and conduct in one's life. In Acts chapter 8, there are three examples of penitence all of which teach us one primary lesson. I want you to notice with me these three examples first. Notice first in Acts 8 and verses 12 and 13, the penitence of the Samaritans. In Acts 8 and beginning at verse 12, he says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Notice secondly, the penitence of Simon that comes later on after he's already obeyed the gospel initially, but then he sins by trying to purchase the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 8, and beginning at verse 18, it says, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. And he says in verse 21, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. And in verse 24, Simon answered and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And then you have the penitence of the eunuch. In Acts 8 and verses 36 through 39, after Philip has preached to him Jesus, it says they went on their way, and they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. Did you notice what all three of those examples of penitence had in common? that all three of those examples emphasized urgency. When Philip preached the gospel to the, to the Samaritans, they responded with immediate action. They believed and they were baptized. There wasn't a, well, you know, I need to know more, or what about this or that. No, they just obeyed. Simon, when he, after he had obeyed the gospel and then sins, and, and the apostles tell him, you need to repent and pray because of this wickedness. What does Simon do? He says, you pray for me right now. Right now, let's go ahead and take care of it. There wasn't a, well, let's wait till tomorrow or, or wait for me to you know, get my attitude in check and really get some things worked out for myself and, and then we'll pray about it. No, it was immediate response. With the Ethiopian treasurer, after Philip had preached Jesus, upon the very sight of water, he said, let's do it now. There was no debate about whether or not baptism was necessary or essential to salvation. There wasn't a, an opportunity or, or there wasn't an occasion for him to say, hey, let's go back to Jerusalem and, and we'll take a church vote to see if I'm a good candidate for baptism. There wasn't any of that. Just immediate response and action to the preaching of the gospel. Friends, when it comes to penitence in Acts chapter 8, it was immediate. Their preaching was impactful and their penitence was immediate. No waiting, no excuses, no voting, just immediate action to make one's life right with God. Let's talk then together about the practice for us, some application from what we've examined about the preaching and the penitence of the first century church. The application in this respect is simple. Are we ready to be what they were in our preaching and in our penitence? See, 
as I mentioned last week, it should be our goal not to just be like the church that we read about in the New Testament, but to be the church that we read about in the New Testament. And if we're going to be the church that we read about in our Bibles, then we need to take a pause and examine our preaching and our penitence today. As we think about our preaching today, we must consider the scope of our preaching. And that is, are we going everywhere to everyone? Are we doing our very best to reach as many as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ? When you examine these brethren in Acts chapter 8, it just didn't seem to matter to them who it was or where it was. Wherever the Lord was taking them, they were willing to go. Philip was willing to preach in Samaria to a multitude of individuals, to many who were obeying the gospel. And at the same time, he was willing and ready to fulfill a call to go out into a desert place to an Ethiopian, to one individual who needed to hear the gospel. It just didn't seem to matter to them. You know, wherever they needed to be and whoever was willing to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were willing to take the gospel to them. Are we so willing? I know individuals sometimes have said, you know, I, well, I just can't talk to a stranger. Okay. What about your friends? What about your coworkers? What about our family members? These people are not strangers, and yet we all know people uh, that we see every day people who we love that are close to us that need to obey the gospel. Are we doing what we can to take the message to them? What about those individuals who may be considered by our society to be less desirable candidates? One of the things that I love about the parable of the sower is that the sower just went forth to sow seed. The sower didn't predetermine who was going to be good soil and bad soil nor did the sower discriminate against the souls. And that's what we find ourselves doing sometimes. Sometimes we convince ourselves, well, I've not talked to them about the gospel because I, I know that they wouldn't really be interested. You know, or, you know I, they're not good soul. Don't make that decision for them. Present the gospel and let them determine which soil they're going to be. At the same time, we need to be careful about discriminating against the souls, deciding who's worthy of hearing the gospel and who's not. All people of every race, male and female, nationality, whatever the case may be, all people are living souls who need the gospel. Friends, when we make efforts to study with someone, our aim and goal should be to exalt Christ and Him crucified. Our preaching should be to everywhere and to everyone who needs it and our focus should be on Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, he said, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Personal stories and illustrations and those things have their place, but let's not allow them to take the place of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Anything beyond that may be helpful, but it shouldn't take center stage. We also need to consider the spirit of our preaching do we possess the same kind of zeal that these brethren possess in Acts chapter 8 to tell others about Christ? Again, it's amazing to think about Philip running to the chariot and running with the chariot. And sometimes I get the impression or get the feeling, and, and I've been guilty of this myself, of running away from opportunities to tell someone about Christ. You know, we come up with with plans and ideas and, and excuses for not telling someone. We're running away. We're, we're more like Jonah than we are Philip at times, running away from what God would have us to do. Think about this for a moment. Have you ever sat down and asked someone uh, who you know is a grandparent and asked them to tell you about their grandchildren? You know, and they just smile from ear to ear and they just begin to glow and they, they just keep talking about all the wonderful things about their grandchildren and, you know, and, and they just keep going and going. You don't have to pull at them. You don't have to prod. You don't have to you know, force them to tell you about it. They're just happy to tell you. Friends, that should be our reaction when we tell others about Jesus Christ. We should smile from ear to ear. There should be a glow about us when we're talking about Jesus. 
And we shouldn't have to be forced and pushed and prodded to do this. It should be something that just flows out of us because of our great love for Christ. We not only need to consider our preaching, but then we need to examine our penitence. Specifically, we need to ask the question, is it urgent or is it delayed? Too often times, just like our excuses for not preaching the way that we should, we make excuses for putting off making our lives right with God. We say things like, well, I'm just not ready yet, or I don't know enough yet. I've heard individuals say things like, you know, when I get my life in order, then I'll make things right. Which is ridiculous to think because it's Jesus who sets your life in order. You know, you don't wait and go to the doctor till you're feeling better. You don't go through the sickness and say, well, now that I'm feeling better, I'll go to the doctor. Why then would we wait until we've tried to get things in order ourselves to go to the great physician? Think about Agrippa who said, almost. Think about Felix who said, at a more convenient season. We make those same excuses. We say, well, when I'm not so busy, then I'll devote more time and service to Christ and to His church. And on and on down the list, we could go of the excuses that we sometimes make. But friends, if you're joining us today and you've never obeyed the gospel, or if you've got sin in your life that has not been repented of, and yet you're living under the notion that you want to be a Christian and have heaven as your home, then you must realize that these brethren, the church that we're trying to be, the church of the first century, acted with a sense of urgency. Oftentimes my question to those who say, well, I'll wait till tomorrow, or I'll wait till some later date. My question to those who wait is, what makes you think that you have more time? What is it that makes you think that you have tomorrow? Because the truth is, is that none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. James said, what is our life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. One of the devil's greatest wiles is just wait a while. The devil would love nothing more than to cause us to wait until it's too late to do anything about our sinful condition. A reading of Acts chapter 8 challenges us to examine our own preaching and our own penitence. But friends, ultimately the point is this. We cannot be what they were with an unwillingness to preach to all, to preach Jesus, and to preach with excitement and zeal. Nor can we be what they were by waiting until some future time, which may or may not ever come, to make things right. What we know needs to be made right today. Are we ready to be what they were in preaching and in penitence? I hope you'll consider that today and examine yourself as I'll seek to do the same with myself. Of course, in order to truly be what they were, we must first begin by obeying the gospel. And in Acts chapter 2, when Peter and the eleven were preaching on the day of Pentecost, they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's where it begins. If we want to be what they were, then we must do what they did. Are we ready to be what they were? Have we obeyed the gospel the way that they obeyed the gospel? We know that 3,000 souls in Acts chapter 2, they did repent and they were baptized. And the Lord added them to those that were being saved and Acts chapter 2 ends by telling us that the Lord continues to add every day those that are being saved. If you've not been added to the body of Christ, that's where it begins. But for those of us who have, ask the question today, have we been what they were in preaching and in penitence and going back to last week in our service and in sacrifice? I hope you'll join us next week for part 3 of this study as we continue to dive into this question are we truly ready to be what they were? Thank you again for tuning in, and God bless. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care, and bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and
Do you have any questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a church of Christ near you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number, and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in, and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him. Singing provided by the Edmund Church of Christ, Edmund, Oklahoma, producers of In Search of the Lord's Way. You can visit their website at www.searchtv.org.